Hey, welcome to Mind Matters, the podcast where we talk about everything concerning mental health and substance use. We talk about trends. We talk about our community. I'm your host, Wendy McCarty Van Bemmel. It's so nice to see you all. To my right, I have Shaney Sloan, and we'll just kind of go through and say hi. Hi, I'm Shaney Sloan. I'm a community outreach liaison at University Behavioral Center. Awesome. Hi, my name is Amanda Packle. I work at Palm Point Behavioral Health and I am their business development and outreach specialist. And I'm Marnie Stallman. I'm a psychologist and the CEO of the Mental Health Association of Central Florida. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited. I am too. Well, we want to talk a little bit today about community mental health and what does that mean? And especially, I'm excited to talk to you from your point of view. Mm-hmm. And I know you've been in Central Florida for quite a while. 50 well, years. Woo! Walk us through how we've changed and where we're at currently in Central Florida. So I like to refer to our community as a big, small town. Yes, agree. So how we've changed is we are internationally known and recognized because we're the tourist destination capital of the universe. Um, We are a, a center of diversity and inclusion kind of an island in the state of Florida from that respect and sometimes in this, the country. Um, but for a lot of people like myself who grew up here, went to high school here, have worked here, um, I still appreciate the fact that there are people that I know who have been in the field or been in our community for periods of time. And we can have an open and transparent dialogue where we don't have to have a lot of backfill, backstory. Um, We know what's going on. We know and have assessed. In a lot of ways, the community hasn't changed very much in terms of um, the needs that are here. That was going to be my next question. And the capacity. I think what what has transformed is that there are more resources available. Which is a good um, thing. And that access is improved slightly. But I think when we talk about the same conversations we might have had 25 years ago, we're still talking about transportation and how do people find the locations that they need to get to. We're still talking about health insurance and whether or not they have the means to afford the treatment options that are available. Um, The limited numbers of options that may be in a particular community. How do communities that have disparities access and have conversations about bringing forward the opportunities that are available and making people comfortable Um, with normalizing the conversation about mental health. So some ways, yeah, bigger, and in some ways, just exactly the same. That's interesting. So are you seeing anything in particular today, or what do you see most commonly that people are asking for help for? You know, we're getting a lot of calls for individuals who have chronic illness Uh, around their mm -hmm. mental health because there's such limited options for where they can... um, reside. Housing has definitely intersected into the conversation. Yes. Housing affordability, housing access, having space for individuals um, that may have chronic conditions that may not be uh, um, appropriate to be at home but need to be housed and where that is. And then I would say probably second to that um, would be adolescent and youth. Mm. Um, And just the outcry that we've seen and heard about is very real, very real as we talk about really young kids. We had a client just recently, six years old. Um, So young. Really young, talking about harming themselves. Um, So yeah, those would be my two. I I was wondering, as you're talking about the issues um, that still exist since they've kind of stayed the same, has access to care and, and what kind of people are accessing it? Has that changed, in your opinion, with the stigma kind of letting up? I, I guess there's less shame and guilt in getting help, um, at least from an outside perspective in that I've seen, you know, 20 years ago, there was, oh, you're taking your kid to a therapist. And now it's like, oh, go take your kid to a therapist. Mm-hmm. There's more um, excitement acceptance. and support and acceptance around getting help. So has has the stigma changed enough to the point where people are accessing care more? I think it's changed, but it's not enough. The normalization of the conversation to say that mental health is health is something that's still in the vernacular is not something that when people hear that, they're like, well, what do you mean? They they don't understand that when you ask a question about sleep hygiene, how that could be related to stress, anxiety and depressive disorder. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. They just think that you're, you know, oh, you're they say you're stressed, but they don't understand the intersections with that. So I think that it has. I think as we're coming post pandemic. I think what, uh, and I just had this conversation with somebody yesterday, 
you know, what the pandemic did um, in many, many ways was horrifically traumatic. But in other ways, it innovated. It forced us to innovate around some specific topics. And behavioral mental health was certainly one of them. And I think the fact that we commonly all had the same shared experience with mm. details behind it, yeah. where we were all locked in, we were all isolated, we all had difficulties with recovering and coming back out, how we processed being bullied of wearing a mask and getting a vaccination or not, um, integrating back into workforce or school place or faith place. Those are now common experiences that I think have helped to destigmatize and help to normalize conversations. But we have a lot more ways to go. We still have environments where, particularly in workplace, mm -hmm. that it's still not great or comfortable. Um, we're seeing statistics coming out from you know, the Society of Human Resource Managers that talk about the fact that more than 70 to 80 percent of workforce employees or HR managers when they're surveyed are saying that the employee does not feel comfortable disclosing that they're having a mental health, not crisis, but issue. And I think also it's important to note for the conversation there's a distinct difference between people that have chronic mental illness and people that have a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. They can be linked, sure. but people that have mental health crisis don't necessarily have a chronic condition that precipitates that. Um, and in the workspace, I think it's still difficulty, particularly by type of employer and employment. So if some are more welcoming and opening to creating workspaces that are not a bullying environment, that create safe space, that accommodate um, and then you have other career paths, you know, take attorneys, for example. Could you imagine if you were a young associate in a large firm and you're expected to work a 50 to 60, 70 hour work week and you come in and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a mental health day today. You know, so yeah. I think to short answer, long answer your question uh, again, yes, but m much, much more to go. Yeah, we've definitely, I think, made an incremental progress, but there is so much to, to learn and educate because there's communities that don't have access to sometimes working in this. I, I forget how much the stigma hasn't changed until I'm faced with a situation where I'm forced to recognize that the stigma is still there mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that people can call me, can call us and, and say, Hey, I'm struggling. They can call mental health association and say, Hey, I need help, but I can't afford it. Um, but they've, we've created those environments to be welcoming and accessible. And so, you know, hotel managers that may experience people coming in with mental health or substance use crisis or doctors and hospitals that received six months of addiction education, mental health education, they're 20 years down the line mm -hmm. practicing. What they learned 20 years ago may not be applicable today. Yeah, I would love to see psychiatry not be a rotation, mm. but an integration. Absolutely. Oh, I like that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because when you talk, so I recently was at a conference that was here in Central Florida. Um, it was a national conference for individuals um, who had limb loss. Okay. Wow. So the limb loss either occurred because of a disease uh, or traumatic injury. Um, the, a lot of veterans, um, individuals with diabetes. Um, it depends. You know, there's lots and lots of reasons uh, how they got to that point. Um, and they asked us to come in and, and create a, a breakout session, and it was packed because people are like, people don't realize that when you're diagnosed with a medical condition, of course there's going to be psychological and behavioral ramifications about what it is, right? Absolutely, yeah. From learning that you're, you know, pre-diabetic or if you're obese or if you have a limb loss, you know, breast cancer patients, any general kind of cancer patients, there's uh, huge complications and comorbidities for anxiety, stress, and depression mm -hmm. that have to be, as an underlying con component of the condition, managed and talked about. Yeah. Um, and so in, in terms of what you just said about, you know, our, our medical professionals get a very short window to rotate through something, and it's a very, uh, it's an experience that I don't think um, really some does adjust it. I there. think the exception, though, is in mm -hmm. um, in nursing, yeah. especially here in Central Florida, that 
we have the UCF College of Nursing and um, the dean there that is so committed to embedding community-based nursing philosophy and rotating that into um, the experience so that, because community-based health is, is, is unique. It's people like, oh, you're just in the community. Well, that's more than that was my next question for you how do you embed yourself in communities that are one underserved or maybe have that generational stigma of well i'm not gonna go in and maybe go to the clinic like how do you embed yourself how do you provide a welcoming environment that's gonna kind of get into the community and and bring people in so we try to push in okay um we try to never say no when invited in but I have to tell you that um, this is kind of linked to the workforce issue that we're seeing in this, in the field. Yeah, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time, very very long time, um, and even when I was in the early '90s working in child adolescent based hospital work, if you found a child adolescent psychiatrist, they were referred to as a unicorn because they're just so unusually rare, and it's still that way. But to to go back to your question. The workforce issue is we have to create pathways for individuals who look like and talk like and are from those communities as peers with their own singular lived experiences Mm -hmm. in those communities to go in. So I'm a Jewish white woman in my almost 60s, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to go in and talk to someone from the Haitian Creole community, which is very large and growing here after the diaspora of Hurricane Maria. And we have to do a better job both at the high school level. I've talked to the district schools about this. We have magnet programs for performing arts. My daughter was in one. We have magnet programs uh, for Emory Riddle and aeronautics. We have magnet programs for languages. And I, you know, we have a elementary school that teaches Mandarin. We don't have anything that says, hey, would you like to go into social services? You're right. Mm-hmm. I never thought of would that. Would you like we to don't. go into a yeah. helping field? Would you, you know. That's so true. And then we don't ladder them the same way that we ladder other opportunities for career development so that when someone's graduating or, pers- or trying to lay out what's their path forward after high school graduation, there's there's an, a- there's an area, there's a pathway, there's, you know, hey, this, this looks like something that right. I might be interested in, and how do we enable that, and how do we assist them? How do we create internship opportunities? How do we bring peers into the conversation? In, more diverse, in right. a more diverse way. Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the tools I've been excited to see that Florida unusually has let out on on this is, is the peer support certification process. So I guess my question is, if we're talking about ease of access or sometimes lack thereof, especially in Central Florida, um, specifically in Brevard, there's a lot of, we see a lot of veterans, we see a lot of first responders. Um, other than, I guess, kicking the door down, especially with these, um, a lot of engineering and aerospace companies, they all have clearances. It's all mm-hmm. either retired military, first responders. The stigma is, it's it's beyond taboo. Um, what would be your advice, I guess, coming in, just, you know, other than, than trying to focus on EAPs, and what would be your advice to try to, I guess, break through to a, to a population that I don't even think they stigmatize it. I think that mental health is almost dismissed. I think it's suppressed. Mm-hmm. Um, another th- fun fact about Brevard County that many people don't know is it's the capital of um, retirees from the United Auto Workers. Oh, oh, really? That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Oh, Daytona. Yep. Speedway. Well, that makes, that's Volusia. That's Volusia. That's oh. Volusia but, but just v- thinking about the community and the people mm-hmm. that I know. Correct. A hundred percent. Brevard County for, and still is for a very long time, time has been demographically skewing to an older generational Mm -hmm. and so there you have to not just overcome the stigma of hey you should talk about this but the ingrained um, conditioning that has taken place over their lifetime being 60 70 80 years old where mental health was talked about in terms of being institutionalized right 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 we didn't get to the community health act until 1963 Mm -hmm. and the national mental health act started in 1946 so that span of years in between we didn't even have in florida until 1972 the the florida mental health act which was the protection of individuals who are now euphemistically that we call the baker act does anybody know why it's called the baker act 
the lady who it's my favorite question to ask. I actually Florida don't. Middle. The and lady who was the day. Who, so the yeah. first woman elected to the Florida State Legislature was named Maxine Baker. She okay. was from Miami Dade County. The second woman elected was named Beth Johnson, and she was from Central Florida. And those two women, when they got to the state legislature, said, "What? We, we nothing." And so they were the original authors of the Florida Mental Health Act, and it euphemistically became known as the Baker Act, named after Maxine. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on in legislation, the new bill that's on, uh, that is being looked at for law enforcement, kind of what's going on in legislature right now? Yeah, so we are in what's called committee week. So the legislature will convene this January for its uh, session. And we saw over the last two to four years, really for the first time, meaningful work being done legislatively to enshrine patient rights, to bring peer support into the conversation. Uh, last year, there was there was a, a bill passed that created a pilot at a prison to use and start uh, utilizing individual peers to oh, come back awesome. into the prison population so that when they come out from their incarceration, they're connected and tethered, which is really amazing. But uh, to your point, there are some really important component pieces that still are missing. It wasn't until the last two years that under the Baker Act, an individual that was under the 18 still had to be transported by a law enforcement officer, handcuffed and put into an LEO vehicle. And parent notification was not a requirement. Wow. Whoa. Only at the time that they were arriving at the Baker Act receiving facility would that facility then initiate contact with the parent. Now the law is that at the time, especially if it's coming from school, that parent or guardian must be attempted to be contacted. Because we know that especially for those elementary, middle school age children and even high school, you know, the escalation component goes wildly up, but it has the opportunity to come down if mm -hmm. you have somebody that is and knows them and can help them kind of come come back to a place because obviously it's the the resource of last resort um, when you do that so legislatively speaking um, we're waiting for some of the mental health bills to drop so to speak they're in drafting that will continue to work on that and continue to bring um, funding last legislative cycle we had le record legislative allocations or appropriations as they're called funding mental health across the state right. it was about 136 million dollars but keep this in mind the state of florida when it appropriates money through the budget those dollars for behavioral health care one are never reoccurring we have to ask every year two they come down through the department of children and family and then down through what's called managing entities and there are six managing entities Ours here in Central Florida is called Central Florida Cares. They're fantastic. But that $136 million now has to be divided by six. Six cats. The six MEs. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? yeah. And then inside the dividing of that, the first priority is the funding of beds, mm -hmm. crisis beds, mm -hmm. and the mobile crisis units mm -hmm. that we know are here in Central Florida. Can you talk so a little bit about what mobile really crisis small. is? It's really small. $136 million yeah. looks really big, mm -hmm. yeah. and then it gets really exponential. Now you're talking $25 yeah. Yeah. million. And when you look at the cost of care, um, as that funding comes out, the cost of care has increased. Mm -hmm. The cost of uh, secure transportation has increased. And mm -hmm. so it's trying to then balance out from those managing entities how to best utilize the funds to create the most access to care. Right, and in those ME's responsibilities is also embedded the uninsured. And something that's going on here in the state of Florida after the federal administration heralded that the PHE was no longer in effect, which was around April of 2023, what that meant was, particularly for Florida, that's not a Medicaid expansion state, anybody that came in during the PHE that got Medicaid during that three to four, three and a half year period has to be recertified. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing what's referred to as the great unwinding. Yeah. Individuals that were unable to get Medicaid coverage for not just behavioral, but medical as well. We have medically complex children um, that were now qualified that are being unwound. Latest numbers that I saw from the Florida Policy Institute, which was just in the last um, few weeks is, you know, we're well over almost 300,000 that have been unwound since wow. April. And the number is not stopping. That's mm -hmm. 
going to continue you, to grow. Have you or anyone here seen an increase? Because I think I sure have noticed the increase of patients either without insurance, but mm-hmm. not just that, without insurance that end up reaching crisis because of lack of access to their medication. So that's where the Mental Health Association can come in, back to your question of what's a resource. So we operate the only free and charitable clinic for the uninsured in Central Florida. And the criteria is that they have to be at or below 200% of federal poverty guidelines. For a family of four, that's about 54, 55,000. For an individual, it's about 23,000. They can come to the clinic. They can participate in outpatient psychotherapy, but they can also get their medications That's awesome. free. That's great. Wow. We pay for them. That's amazing. Because we know that uh, particularly for individuals that are chronically mentally ill, dealing with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, that their crises are often precipitated by the fact that their medications are not available. Yes. And either because they can't pay for it or they don't know where to get it for the script to get filled if they're uninsured. So those patients can come to us. We have a psychiatric board-certified ARNP that will see them via telehealth or in person. And then they can walk across the parking lot from where we're located to the Orange County Medical Clinic, and they can get that script filled, and we get the bill. Look at that access to care. It's great. That's That's great. Can you speak on the Compact Act at all? Have we seen um, an increase of that actually being utilized with our veterans? Um, So within the veteran population, you know, the VA is pouring millions and millions of dollars into um, veteran behavioral care because there has been an exponential rise in suicide within the components of that particular constituency group. Um, It's been difficult, though. One thing that I recently found out that I didn't know is that if you served for less than two years and were discharged, you're not eligible for VA benefits. What? But you still would be eligible for compact. For compact, yeah. Which is a little different, but yeah. yeah. So I think we also have great stigma there as well Mm -hmm. with our veterans feeling comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it's an opportunity where we could really enhance greatly by incorporating the peer support specialist model. I was just going to mention, I know that at least Orlando down in Lake Nona, their whole health has, I don't don't know the number of peers, but I know that they have several veteran peers working um, in that department. And there's... One, there's a recovery community organization statewide that is specific for veterans and having that specialty in like, okay, you're seeking recovery from either mental health or substance use and you're also a veteran. Here's a group of people Mm -hmm. that have been through it Um, and and peer support, not just from like the lived experience of being going through that, you know, having mental health crisis, having chronic mental health, chronic substance use, but like from the family perspective, I think we lack like my peer support denotion that I'm getting is a youth young adult because we seriously lack a youth peer support and a family peer support. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. And back to the veterans, one of the things that's exciting to see is with the implementation and rollout of 988, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. can actually through the trees find your penguin, so to speak, your people that you want and feel might have some sense of what your experience is like that you can feel comfortable starting to have a conversation and for a lot what I really also applaud with, and we've been involved with the rollout here locally is you know the the suicide crisis line used to be you know if there's a crisis this is where you call but 988 has really evolved into a talk helpline as well mm-hmm. and that. for a lot That's of individuals it can it. be that first step normalizing yes. because you don't have to sit face to face with someone it's a voice and you can have a little bit of Um, protection about your anxiety about someone looking at you you know how you're seen and um, or doing it through text as well and I think that we need to do a a great a much better job in letting the community know we still run into far too many people that don't know what 988 is and now tell us a little bit about I'm sorry uh, the lifeguard program yeah so uh, in 2021 um, or 2020, really, uh, my daughter was 13 years old. She's going to love me talking about her. <laughs> and she was at that time and still is a theater kid. She was that. all the way. And we went 
uh, we were removed from school, school closed for that year. And so I went from having a vivacious photo bomber who once went to school dressed as a pinata. I love that. And when I say it was a pinata, she actually got a pinata <laughs> and cut the hole out of the bottom and wore that as the hat. I love it. And then Gosh. decorated herself. And I said, you're, you're dressed as a pinata. And her response was, yes, so. <laughs> so that's who she is that's who she was and I want I watched her go like this to very small and so as I was talking with peers in my community family members I said something bad is coming and at that point we were still trying to get a handle on not dying from COVID and right. there was such controversy about the vaccine and masking and isolating and all of this kind of thing and for many years, the Mental Health Association has had a suicide prevention campaign that they and we have put out to the public um, during Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, during Mental Illness Awareness Month, that has traditionally highlighted noted elected officials and people that you would know that t talk about, you know, call, call for help. And I realized that my daughter and her peers would never watch spectrum tv where those psas would run well yeah we have netflix they don't drive <laughs> so they're not going to see the billboards mm -hmm. that were you all great vehicles but we had to innovate and we had to change directionally how we were communicating and who we were communicating with and so at that point um, we had a very uh creative team uh at high five digital that we met with and so the the national international symbol for suicide prevention is a life preserver. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about what we wanted to call our program and how we wanted to go about this, we talked about the fact that if you were to throw the life preserver into the water, unless you had somebody that was tethered to it, it's just sitting there and you're going to bob on the water. It has to have two functions. It has to have somebody pulling you back in, and that's the lifeguard. Or That's the, awesome. Right? Yeah. So we called our program You Are a Lifeguard, and we created a series of public service campaigns um, for parents and for uh, peers between the ages of 13 to 18 and then another peer group, 18 to 24, because no one's talking about college kids, mm -hmm. college adults. And um, we put them on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. There it is. Yep. And within a week... She was, you know, people knew who she was from her peer group because she was in the, one of the videos. She's in one of the videos, one of the friends, ones for the kids. And so now it's these couple of years later, we produce the videos, we put them out there as paid sponsored ads. Um, and in the first year, we had almost a million impressions. Wow. And we only paid to push it out into Orange, Seminole, Osceola, and Brevard County. That's impressive. But what happened was they went international because that's what the internet does. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it really was an eye-opening experience to find community and be able to message in. And then the point of being a lifeguard or the, the campaign is to take the pledge to be a lifeguard, either for yourself or someone else. And the lifeguard pledge then takes you to a very robust youarelifeguard.org website which has lots and lots of layers for information and resources, but also to just foster a community mm. where you can be seen. Mm -hmm. And so the PSA program, as I said, we're getting ready into our third year. Um, two more lifeguard uh, PSAs are about to roll out uh, from a grant from the Orlando Magic Youth Foundation. Wow. And this Wednesday on um, November 21st, it will be Mental Health Awareness Night at the Orlando Magic, That's awesome. where we are uh, inviting people to get the magic mindset and uh, participate in taking the pledges because we want lifeguards everywhere. My, uh, my next rollout for the campaign is to talk to school districts to see if we can put um, lifeguard stations. That's great. Which is really just a bench painted in teal and yeah. purple yeah but yeah. what a way to start a conversation yes. especially and just a have and the, make it tangible yes. you know kind of it breaks it, the stigma too. it's certainly not original i've completely ripped it off from That's the whole okay. buddy program of <laughs> no sit alone in the cafeteria yeah. 
kind of thing. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. No, but this great. would be out in a public courtyard area and it's painted in the lifeguard colors. It's got the lifeguard. And if, you know, you just go and sit there and you're either saying I'm available That's to just great. have a conversation. I'm yeah, sitting here that. or I'm sitting here because I need a conversation. Right. Well, Marnie and Amanda and Shaney, thank you so much for this conversation. We talked a little bit about community mental health, where we started, where we're at now. We talked about stigma, what we can do to further the conversation. Talked about becoming a lifeguard, which anybody can do. Absolutely. They can go right on the website of mental health. Take the pledge. Yeah, and take the pledge today. Thank you so much for being My here. My pleasure, and I really want to say, too, for anybody that's listening or watching, if you're not, um, if you don't have available health insurance, um, and you need care and access, call us, yep. and we can assist. And if it's not us, we can link you to other resources that are available in the community. But and we that's, have capacity, and especially if you're in need of medication. Yeah, Mental Health Association of Central Florida. MHACF.org. Yep. One phone call, they will help you One out. Click. You are treated as an individual, and I've seen the work that is done there, and it is just incredible. Thank you for everything you do for our Thank community. Thank you for everything that you do for the community as well and for this opportunity um, to bring information forward. It's really critically important. Agree. Agree. Thank you, viewers, for watching today. See us next time, and enjoy your day.